Notre Dame wrapped up its home campaign on Saturday with a win over Wake Forest, and out of all the impressive individual performances put on by the Irish players, there's a couple who stood out, most notably quarterback Sam Hartman going up against his former team. That's coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? Welcome to another edition of Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Tuesday, November 21st, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Wojcik, and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and now I'm a producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Go to pricepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily Fantasy Sports made easy. The everyday listeners know that on Tuesdays, me and my old co host, Luke Smith, go over the three things that we liked and didn't like from Saturday's game. Fortunately for us, there was a lot more to like coming off Notre Dame's blowout win over Wake Forest compared to the last time we did this after the Irish fell to Clemson. Check it out. Okay, Luke Smith is here, and there have been some rumblings that you were actually not in attendance for the Wake Forest game on Saturday. So I got to ask, are you okay? Should we be concerned? Yeah, I'm good. Um, <laughs> you know, as it turns out, when you uh, when you are, aren't in town for like five weeks in a row, um, it just, sometimes things don't work out and the trip to South Bend does not sound like the, the best thing in the world. So I stayed at home this weekend and that was okay. I don't think I missed a whole heck of a lot. Um, so it was all right. The one thing you did miss was unseasonably warm temps in South Bend. Uh, it was like in the forties. It wasn't crazy okay. warm. Well, I guess I just was, uh, distracted by the sunlight and I I was actually texting my mom during the game she's like it looks beautiful in South Bend and I said I know where was this luck during my senior year because after that USC game in 2017 every single home game after that was cold wet Uh, there was a complete downpour before the Navy game so I was really jealous of the seniors uh, at Notre Dame that they were able to go out on a on a high note in the actual game because I didn't share that same glory with mine and also the weather just made it seem like a much more enjoyable experience for everyone. Yeah, it's it snowed and it was a night game for my last game. So that was I mean, I, that was kind of fun, though, but that was a weird year. We played three straight home games off the bat. So the schedule was really unbalanced that year. Um, but yeah, no, I, definitely, definitely better than past years, I would say. Yeah, it was a good way for Notre Dame to end their season, uh, both for the team and for the fans and everyone who was there in attendance. And Notre Dame just pretty much dominated every single game at home with the exception of the biggest one, the loss to Ohio State. And how the team performed at home compared to the road is is a mystery that we're probably going to be talking about for the rest of the season and throughout the offseason, why that is, why that's been the case so far this season. And then Notre Dame still has one more road game left coming up this Saturday against Stanford. But we are here today to talk about Notre Dame's win over Wake Forest. We will turn the page to that game later on in the week. But let's go over the three things we liked from this game on Saturday. Luke, what was the first thing that stuck out to you? Javante Jean-Baptiste is the first player that sticks out. He had five tackles, a sack tackle and a half for loss and also a blocked field goal. He's had a tremendous year and I would imagine will be one of Notre Dame's highest draft picks this year. I I don't, there's probably only a a guy or two that would go ahead of him. I would imagine um, from Notre Dame, at least just a no doubt knocked it out of the park hit from the transfer portal. And if Notre Dame can have that kind of success again with a defensive lineman this year, um, that would be, that would be very nice. Yeah, it's hard to draw up a better season for this type of transfer, like a graduate transfer who wasn't really even a starter at Ohio State. was more of a reserve player coming in on the defensive line. I actually heard John Bryce from Football Scoop and Irish Illustrated mention that he had talked to some staffers on Ohio State, and they said, we all knew that he had the potential to be this kind of player, but for whatever reason, he wasn't able to put it together at Ohio State. And in his lone season at Notre Dame, he kind of took us all by surprise in the season that he had because he really put it all together, and he's been one of Notre Dame's most consistent players on defense uh, for a unit that's been incredible all season long. Yeah, there's no question about it. Um, I did somehow did not realize he was a Bergen Catholic guy. Um, we've got a lot of those New Jersey kids on this team, and it seems like they, uh, they're they all kind of putting it together this year and maybe will in the future. But, hey, he took a risk on himself, went to 
I mean, let's face it, a step below Notre Dame, even though people probably don't want to, or sorry, a step below where he was at, even if people don't want to hear that. And it paid out in a big way, and, and he's going to get paid as a result. So congrats to him. Yeah, and not only that, he played his best in the biggest games this season. Thomas Harper, too. We could include him uh, in this conversation as well, but definitely a slam dunk hit for Notre Dame in the transfer portal. And speaking of, uh, another player who Notre Dame added in the transfer portal, you might have heard of him, named Sam Hartman. Uh, the first thing I liked in this one was his bounce back game and the fact that he was able to play so well going up against his former team. And I understand that the fan perception of him has drastically changed over the course of the last couple of weeks, considering his approval rating at the start of the season was about as high as it could possibly be for any Notre Dame player. And then what it didn't all start going down after the Ohio state game, but it was progressive. And then after the Clemson game, when, Hartman played terribly, and he even admitted as much uh, in his postgame presser. But I was just really happy for him that he was able to get this win and play so well on senior day because um, he's a guy who, in one season at Notre Dame, one full year as a student, he has completely embraced everything that we all love about the university and the football program. I think he's been a great leader for this team. And even though uh, the season as a whole hasn't been exactly what we had hoped for with him as a starting quarterback, I think he's uh, made a huge impact on this team, on this football program. And you started to hear a little bit uh, about it last week. Like Marcus Freeman said that his impact on Benjamin Morrison is noticeable. Like Benjamin Morrison saw Hartman and the way that he works and the way that he pre prepares. And then Morrison changed the way uh, that he prepared. And he started to come in earlier, stay late. And I think that kind of impact is going to be felt throughout the program for a really long time. And I was just really happy that he was able to go out a winner in Notre Dame Stadium. I agree. I would also say that I think that even if the production or the boost to his draft stock may not have unfolded the way he would have liked, if you just look at the way that Notre Dame was able to market him and the way that he was able to literally profit off that and then just be more in the public eye, you got to think that that's got to be more appealing to quarterbacks that would consider Notre Dame in the future. Now, I know it's another question about whether you can develop quarterbacks like that in Notre Dame, but at least from just the outset and the way that you're marketed, I, I would have to believe that that's going to be very appealing to other targets down the road. Yeah, and he's also the second transfer quarterback at Notre Dame to have success. And uh, Jack Cohn went 11-1. I've seen some people... Uh, some some fans, and this is all coming on social media, so maybe my perception is warped here because I'm just seeing the most negative stuff. People are like, why are we giving any credit to Sam Hartman? He has three losses. Jack Cohn didn't get this kind of love. That's fair. Jack Cohn probably deserved a little bit more credit than he did uh, during his time at Notre Dame, but I would also point out that like, if Sam Hartman was on that team going up against that schedule, you're probably looking at the exact same result. Notre Dame had a much different, much tougher schedule this year, um, and I don't think that the pieces around him were as uh, quite as advertised as we thought they'd be going into the season. But still, I thought that he busted his ass for this team all year. He's been a great leader, and uh, yeah, I, I I understand why some fans don't feel uh, the same way about Hartman, but I still really like him. I'm still really grateful for what he was able to do at Notre Dame this year, and I think that. Uh, down the road, potentially even as early as next season, we're going to miss him a little bit. We could. Um, and it, it looked a lot like what he did in September and in late August across the pond as well. Um, and, and speaking of flashbacks to earlier in the season, Jaden Greathouse finally looked like he was back at full strength on Saturday. Uh, three catches for 71 yards and a touchdown, including a 48-yarder uh, where he has exhibited just this burst to win to the corner. And it was a real reminder to me of what Notre Dame missed over the course of the middle of the season when he was battling that hamstring injury. I think it almost got lost because he missed time or battled with that hamstring injury, how productive he was early on. And I think that maybe not enough credit has been given to how debilitating that hamstring injury was not only to his progress, but the offense in general, you go back to that Ohio state drive where Notre Dame took the lead, um, that whole drive was passes to Rico Flores and Jaden Greathouse, two freshmen, basically. So I don't think that that got stated enough, and it was great to see him have that sort of impact on Saturday and, and makes me really excited about what he could be moving forward. Granted, he stays healthy. It was also a bit of a, a punch to the gut that, man, this would have been nice to have all season if he was healthy. Yeah, it's definitely a little bittersweet seeing him turn on the Jets and score there because that Wake Forest defender – 
I thought he had the angle. I thought it was just going to be a nice chunk play. And then uh, credit to Jaden, man. I didn't realize he had that kind of speed. He's a bigger dude. So when you look at him and you look at the way he moves, you don't necessarily think speedster. But uh, that was really encouraging to see because I feel like most of his catches this season have not been like that. He hasn't had a ton of yards after the catch, but he showed some really impressive bursts there. And I actually want to touch on another freshman receiver. That's the second thing I liked. Rico Flores. You've already talked about him a little bit. Eight catches, 102 yards. First Notre Dame wide receiver with over 100 receiving yards in a game um, since the Fiesta Bowl. Marcus Freeman's first game as a head coach. And the fact that it was a true freshman, it's partially out of necessity. And he's, you know, he's had some up and downs this year for sure. But I think he's actually been Notre Dame's most consistent wide receiving target with the exception of maybe Chris Tyree. But Tyree's had some pretty critical drops as well. So I think um, what Rico Flores has been able to do has been really impressive. The fact that Sam Hartman trusts him as much as, as he does, I think says a lot about his game. And you look at Notre Dame's wide receiving core. Yeah, they had to play a lot of freshmen out of necessity. And it's it's hurt the offense at several times this season. But you hope that going forward here that all these growing pains, all this stuff that Notre Dame's had to deal with this season at the wide receiver position is going to benefit down the road. I agree. And I, I think that you touched on this a little bit earlier in today's episode. This is Monday night as I'm speaking on this, but just having so many guys in this class that have played already in, in not only these two guys, but well, he's not even a walk on anymore scholarship receiver, Jordan Faison. And you also have KK Smith um, and what Brandon James. Name? Yeah, Braylon James waiting in the wings there, too. That's exciting. Uh, there's always going to be some growing pains there, and I know we would have liked to have some more depth. I mean, think about how much this team could have benefited with Braden Lindsey deciding he wanted to play another year of football. Yeah. It's, it's kind of remarkable, honestly. <laughs> I, I wonder if he regrets it at all. I'm sure that like during August, during fall camp, he was probably like, I don't miss football one bit. And he's probably enjoying his life after football. But there are definitely times where Notre Dame really could have benefited from having him or uh, even Deion Colsey, who's still out. And uh, it was actually good to see Matt Salerno back there for a few snaps. Right. I don't even know if he's 100 percent or if they were just trying to get him out there for some snaps on senior day. But Good to have him back in the rotation. I think it's something that we have to consider whenever we talk about the Notre Dame offense this season and the struggles they've had is that they had pretty much only freshman wide receivers and a converted running back to throw to on the outside. That's not really that great. You're not going to see that out of any elite offense in college football these days, but that's what Notre Dame had to roll with this year, um, and it's why it was sort of a weird I guess relationship or a weird dynamic is probably a better word between Sam Hartman and all these young guys because he is so much older than them. Uh, but I do think that Hartman was able to elevate them a little bit and able to help them out along the way. But as we uh, start to near the end of this season, as we look at this offense in the future and like what Notre Dame can learn and develop as they turn the page to next season, I think if anything, you can um, hang your hat on the fact that there's a lot of young talent at the wide receiver position, and hopefully we won't have another season like this at the wide receiver position for a very long time. We'll be right back with Luke Smith in a moment, but first I wanted to tell you about LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's where you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is find the right people for your team faster and for free. I used LinkedIn Jobs a couple years ago, and they made it easy to contact a hiring manager, learn more about the role, and eventually, I got the job. LinkedIn also makes it incredibly easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. All you have to do is add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. We all know hiring people can be time-consuming, but adding the right team member can be invaluable to your business, and LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier than ever. It's why small businesses is right LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Speaking of the future, you have to talk about Steve Angeli here too. Yeah. Um, you and I especially because we have been very dismissive of him in the past. Yeah, I think I'm going complete 180 here. I think I'm all on board. I'm riding with him next year. Uh, three for three for 36 yards and a touchdown in this one. That brings his cumulative stats on the year to 19-24 for 272 yards, four TDs, no picks. 
Jamie Uyama of ISD put it best, I thought. He said he's been accurate like it's a Friday walkthrough whenever he gets an opportunity, and that's true. Every time he comes in, I know that it's been in mop-up duty, but I don't think that backup quarterbacks normally look that great in mop-up duty, and he just kind of comes in smooth, cool, and calm, and, and just runs the offense. I, I'm not here to tell you. He's good enough to win Notre Dame a national championship. I don't know that that's true. It's probably not. Okay. I'm just going to go out there and say that. (laughs) I don't know how many guys are good enough to win Notre Dame a national championship. All I know is the last guy who did this sort of thing where he would come in and it's just like, oh, they scored again. Look, that guy led Notre Dame to the four team playoff twice and ended up being the winningest quarterback in Notre Dame program history. That's Ian Book. Um, in, In a year where I'm not sure there's a slam dunk transfer portal QB target. I'm not opposed to giving Angeli every chance to be QB one in college station next Labor Day. That said, I do think they should still try to pursue somebody because if we've learned anything, injuries happen and you don't want to be in a position where you might only have three guys in that room. Or if you bring a transfer in, I don't know, things can happen. But all I'm saying is that compared to where I felt even going into this year about Steve Angeli, it's night and day. I, I really think this guy might – that there's something there. That That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, the floor is definitely higher than we thought. Like when mm-hmm. he comes out there and he runs with the first-team offense, he definitely looks like he belongs out there. And really, that's all you can ask for out of a backup quarterback, especially one who's only a retro freshman. Um, yeah, I've been really encouraged by what I've seen from Steve Angeli. And I will admit that part of my – I guess, dismissive nature of him at the quarterback position is some stuff that we had heard about him uh, in high school, uh, that his recruiting ranking wasn't even that high, and maybe it was higher than it should have been. Now, I will say that part of that intel may have come from someone who coached at his rival school, so maybe that was a little biased. Uh, Luke, I know you know who I'm talking about, but (laughs) I I think that Steve Angeli, the most important thing is he has not done anything to make us think that he can't at least go out there and run a functioning offense if he is the quarterback for Notre Dame next year. I'm with you. I think that they're going to, they should, and they will probably add a a grad transfer quarterback, someone who has some starting experience. But I don't think that there's going to be another Sam Hartman level player where you just, you get him and immediately he's the starter. Like, even though Notre Dame went through that quarterback competition in the spring, it was very clear where they were going to go with that. Um, So I think that when Notre Dame adds a transfer quarterback, there's actually going to be a legit competition. Does that make the job a little bit less enticing to whoever that quarterback uh, may be? Yeah, probably. But it's still Notre Dame, and it's still an attractive school to go to. And given the success that Notre Dame has had with transfer quarterbacks, I think that they're going to be able to get a good player. But I don't think it's going to be a guy who – takes over the position right away. I think that Steve Angeli is going to have a real shot to be quarterback for Notre Dame next year. And I think he should. Um, If you think about it, too, the top two names that fans wanted, and I don't know how realistic either of these ever were, but they were Michael Pratt and Cam Rising. Michael Pratt announced he's going to play in the Senior Bowl, and Cam Rising is going back to Utah, apparently. I don't know that Cam Rising was a fit at Notre Dame to begin with, to be honest, with what he does. Um but, hey, I know Will Howard's been a name that's been thrown around. I have no idea what's going to happen there. I watched that Kansas game the other night uh, when they, you know, Kansas State played them. Okay, maybe. I, I don't know. I, I like. Yeah. I, it's kind of hard. It's not like, yes, I will absolutely want that guy as my starting quarterback. Who knows? Yeah, it's – it's he's not a, a slam dunk, a home run, or anything like that. But if Notre Dame were to add him, I'd be like, okay, nice. Like, he definitely brings something into the room. He brings some experience. He's a, a bit of a dual threat guy. But I actually wanted to ask you about the Cam Rising thing. I never once entertained the idea that Notre Dame was going to get him or that Cam Rising would even enter his name in the transfer portal. I know he's been there for a million years, but he is so he is Utah football. Like, it's Kyle Whittingham and Cameron Rising. So where do you think those rumors even came from? So I actually don't think that the idea that he might hit the portal was that crazy. I never thought he made sense in Notre Dame, but the reason I thought he could hit the portal is because if you go back to some of Kyle Whittingham's press conferences earlier this year, it seemed like an awkward situation where Rising basically had his own doctor that wasn't the team doctor. And in some of his responses, Whittingham kind of seemed annoyed with what was going on. So uh, maybe people thought, and I don't think they would have been crazy to think that, that he was just like, you know what, we're done here. Like, let's move on. But, hey, if he wants to come back and that relationship is is still fine, solid, then, then yeah, of course he was going to come back. 
I see your point, and I think part of that just has to do with Whittingham's annoyance with being asked so frequently mm-hmm. about Rising's injury status. And Whittingham is like a dude's dude. He is a football guy through and through. So I think his attitude in that situation was probably just due to the fact that he was sick of being asked about it. But Cam Rising isn't an option anymore. Who knows who Notre Dame is going to have a real shot at if – that player is even that good to begin with, but it's definitely something to monitor throughout the next month or so because the transfer portal opens up here in just a couple more weeks. All right, I have one last thing that I liked uh, before we move on to what we didn't like, and that is that Notre Dame continues to blow out teams on senior day. You and I talked about this a little bit already in the show, but way back in 2017, Notre Dame scraped by Navy in an all-time miserable day in South Bend. It was like 35 degrees, raining. Um, The game was disgusting. I hated those alternate uniforms they wore in that game. I know some people are going to disagree with me on that. I'm sorry. It was my last home game. That is not what I wanted to see Notre Dame wearing in that one. So that was a a pretty terrible senior day, I'm going to be honest. I really wanted to leave that game, which I never did when I was a student, but that's just how bad the weather in that game was. But then in the years since... Uh, This is what Notre Dame has done on Senior Day. 2018, your Senior Day, Luke. They beat Florida State 42-13. In 2019, they beat Boston College 40-7. 2020, Syracuse 45-21. 2021, they beat Georgia Tech 55-0, followed up by beating Boston College 44-0. And then this past weekend, they beat Wake Forest 45-7. That's a difference of 271-48. to So blowout wins have become the norm on yeah. senior day, and that's a perfect way to send your seniors off so that that way they can sort of soak it all in. There's no scares. There's nothing like that. And uh, really, we've just come a long way since 2008 Syracuse and 2009 UConn. Hey, or even 2014 Northwestern or 2016 Virginia Tech where you blew a big lead to a mediocre ACC team. So um, that actually I think did play for the ACC title game that year, but – Again, that was another blown lead from the 2016 team. So it, you're right. It's been a lot better lately. Um, I would say that Georgia Tech and Wake were on the higher ends on the weather spectrum because 2018 Florida State, it, there was like feet of snow on the ground. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if you remember this, the Notre Dame defensive backs came out shirtless pregame and the, yeah. the Florida State guys were like, those boys didn't want to play that day. Um, no. Boston College was also kind of a crappy day. I remember that one. It was it was pretty cold that day in 2019. 2020, that was there was nobody in the stands really besides like faculty, but that was not a super nice day. Last year was a blizzard yeah. too. So um yeah, nice to have some better weather, I guess, this year too. I feel like there was some snow on the ground before that Syracuse game, but they moved it off. Or maybe I'm just like my mm-hmm. mind. No, I think you're right. Of, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it's been a good run of senior days. I think the best one had to be 2021 Georgia Tech because I think the weather was like beautiful that day. And, um, it was nice. Yeah. Myron Tagovailoa, Amosa had a touchdown. Like that was about as perfect of a senior day as you can get. But this is a new tradition for Notre Dame. It's just beating the piss out of some overmatched ACC team every single year. I, I don't think that the schedule for 2024 is out yet, so we don't know who Notre Dame's opponent will be next year on senior day. But um, hopefully it's another th- another run like this. Well, if the Army game doesn't happen in Yankee Stadium, then we don't know. But if it does, then I think it's going to be Virginia. So not not really that crazy out of the realm of possibility. Luke and I still have plenty more to get to, but I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you about prize picks. You've heard me talk about prize picks before in the podcast. It's a skill-based, real-money daily fantasy sports game, and I have had so much fun playing it during the football season, and now you can play during basketball season as well. You just select two or more players, pick more or less than their projected stats, and place your entry. PricePix even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. PricePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy, and that's just one of the reasons why I think it's the best daily fantasy game out there. Go to PricePix.com slash LockedOnCollege and use code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match for $100. That's PricePix.com slash LockedOnCollege, code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match up to $100. Price picks, daily fantasy sports, made easy. I think we've covered it on the things that we liked from this one. Let's move on to the things we didn't like, and it sounds like you've got something to get off your chest. Yeah. Um, how do you watch the NBC broadcast every week? <laughs> I think one of our friends texted you that during the game, and wow. Um, I struggled to believe NBC runs this back with Jack Collinsworth and Jason Garrett. 
much like Saturday was the last game at Notre Dame Stadium for Jack Swarbrick and Father John Jenkins, so too should it have been for those droning, just whatever you want to call them, just blocks. Um, it's an incredibly uninteresting and frankly confusing broadcast at times. Like Garrett will try to give input that just has nothing to do with the situation. Um, and when you listen to him, it kind of a, it's amazing to me that he coached in the NFL. Um, I, I just I don't care if it's a rotation, but these guys shouldn't be on any major college football broadcast anytime soon. And I always kind of thought that when people were complaining about this broadcast that they were exaggerating, but no. It's not a good broadcast. You know what's funny, too, is that on the same day that they announced a five-year extension, there were multiple problems with the cameras where they'd go mm-hmm. to the replay and it was just a completely wrong camera. It'd be one. It was just static cam just looking at a yard line and there's action going on around it. It was not the best day for the entire NBC broadcast there. Um, so for your question about how I do it every week, sometimes I don't hear it. Uh, because I'm at work and there's different games on, and if Notre Dame's playing Wake Forest, that's probably not getting the audio in the room. But, yeah, it was – I don't know. I guess I'm just used to it at this point. I know what to expect from this group. I, I would be surprised if that's the same group next year because I there's been some reports out there. I think Tim Priester from Irish Illustrated mentioned that Jason Garrett is trying to get back into coaching. Interesting. Good um, luck. I don't know what Jack <laughs> – I, too, would like to get into coaching. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with Jack. Um, I I think that NBC next year, now that they've had this full year under their belt and there's going to be more Big Ten teams, I think that they're going to go through a drastic reshuffling. So I think it's going to be a little bit different. I will say, to give them a little bit uh, of the benefit of the doubt, the fact that Notre Dame had Mike Tirico as their play-by-play guy for several years, we were really spoiled because he's like one of, if not the best play-by-play guys around. And... uh, Going from that to this to this group makes it just that much worse. So, yeah, I hear you, and uh, I do think that that was probably the last game from that group as, like, the regular group, regular crew for Notre Dame home games going forward. Sure hope so, even though, it, it, like, thankfully it doesn't yeah, bother me. you don't too, really too have to deal with it that often, and then when you do, you're like, oh, okay, I see it now. <laughs> All right, well, let's, <laughs> let's talk about that sequence at the end of the first half. If you can even call it, like, I don't even know what to call it. That was painful to watch. And when I rewatched it, it was even more embarrassing. Uh, so just to rehash it here, Notre Dame was moving the ball well. They called some timeouts so that they could get the ball back with some time to try to drive the ball down the field and score right before halftime, like they have done multiple times this season. Then they, uh, I don't have the exact yard line, but they get a first down and then the, they decide to spike it. Okay, some people wanted them to to keep it going, run a play on first down. Notre Dame decides to down it, whatever. Then, I don't know if they didn't get the play in until very late or they tried to change the play with just a few seconds left, but then Sam Hartman is forced to call a timeout, Notre Dame's final timeout of the half, after they already stopped the clock of the spike. I don't know why Marcus Freeman decided to use that timeout there. I felt like Losing five yards in that situation wasn't that bad. I thought that preserving that timeout was way more important than the five yards. Either way, Freeman elects to use the timeout. Then Hartman gets pressured on the ensuing play. He gets rid of it with his left hand just to get an incomplete pass. I don't even know if he saw Holden Stays. Holden Stays makes the acrobatic play for a net loss of four yards, and that nullified any hope of Notre Dame scoring a touchdown. Um, Sam Hartman was visibly pissed, and yeah, Notre Dame ended the half with a field goal when they definitely had an opportunity to score a touchdown. And I think there's multiple people responsible for that whole debacle. But what did you uh, like? What are your thoughts on that? Wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I honestly, given just how things have gone this year, it was kind of just a microcosm of everything, like just kind of negligence, mismanagement of the, of the clock. Like it's it personnel. We've seen it time and time again. So I can't say, even though it was just like kind of a, a combination of, of things all happening at once, it's something we really haven't seen before from this group. So I, it wasn't really that shocking. I will say, and Holden stays his defense, and I forget who said this or put this out there, Somebody suggested that like he may have thought that was a fumble because he couldn't really see. And and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there. I don't know if that's true or not, but that could have been what happened because that's kind of what it looked like to me too. But yeah, I mean, just a really bad sequence. And of course, that's what happened. Yeah, and it's also instinctual to try to catch the ball. 
I feel like more often than not, you see a play like that, your natural instinct is to to catch it, even though it was not the right decision there. Do you think that a, a sequence like that, let's let's assume it was the fault of Jared Parker and whoever was calling in plays, do you think that's something that when Freeman is deciding whether or not he wants to retain Parker, how much do you think something like that factors into the equation? Because it's also not the first time that Notre Dame's operation was bad in that game. There was a drive earlier in the game where on third down, they try to change the play with literally eight seconds left on the play clock. Hartman gets pressured. He kind of throws it, phase on, runs the wrong route, and he immediately looks at the sideline like, come on, guys, you cannot be changing the play this late in the play clock and expect everything to work out. So those little things like that, even though Notre Dame's offense played well, do you think that stuff is going to factor in later on when Freeman has to decide about Parker's future? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I tend to believe that this decision has already been made, to be honest. And really? I, I think Why do you that say that? Is, I don't know. Uh, it's totally gut feeling. Um, I just I don't know that that is going to make an impact. I tend to believe he's going to be back next year, to be honest with you. Just point blank. That's, that's sort of how I feel. And I could be dead wrong. Um, I don't know that I even really... I don't know that I feel that strongly about it either way. I just, I kind of think he's going to be back. Yep. I think he's going to be back to odds are now we could be wrong here. Right. I, this is not necessarily a defense of Jared Parker. This I don't is even just, want to say, I hope I'm wrong because it's somebody's job. So I'm not going to yeah. say that, but I, I don't know. I, this is just kind of what I think I could be wrong. I think Notre Dame is going to blow out Stanford. And I think that not that these two games are going to change Freeman's mind, but I think he's going to eva- he's going to wait to make that evaluation until the full body of work, uh, at least in terms of the regular season, is complete. And I think a nine and three record. Uh, and there's certainly some stats that say like Notre Dame is top fifteen in scoring offense and yards per play, points per drive, stuff like that. And I get that the bulk of those stats were inflated going up against weaker defenses, but I think that Marcus Freeman is going to be a little patient with Jared Parker again. We could be completely wrong. This isn't even a defense. We're just speculating as to what Marcus Freeman is thinking about that. Um, Okay, so we talked about Notre Dame screwing up the end of the first half. I also have no idea what the people in the booth saw when they decided to overturn Chris Tyree's catch. It didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but it was a really good catch by Chris Tyree. He ended up finishing the game with no receptions, although I think he got totally robbed in this one because he was going down and he squeezed the ball in between his arms, and yes, the ball did graze the ground, but by that point, he had already taken his other hand and put positioned it on the ball, so he had... Uh, control the ball. It did not move at all. And then they call it a catch on the field. They go to the booth. And I even joked uh, with my roommate who's watching with me. And I was like, they're going to overturn this for no reason. Like there is nothing on that replay that would suggest that he lost control of the ball. Of course, they decide to overturn it. And they bring in that hack, that uh, ref (laughs) correspondent, who of course is going to side with the refs. That is, side note on broadcasting, the most worthless job in the world is the ref who comes on. This is beyond football. This is basketball. This is anything. They come in and they always well, usually agree does both, with the ref. Both football yeah. and basketball. Yeah, they yeah. come in. They're like, whatever the ref said, yep, good call. Here's the reasons why. And then they just move on. Just worthless, uh, terrible call, worthless analysis uh, after that. And I just I, I just had to air that grievance. Yeah, so I actually couldn't hear what was being said. Um, and that will bleed into my next point about what I didn't like. But, um, <laughs> but I... I I don't remember what juncture in the game that happened, but if I recall correctly, after the catch, they went to commercial and then they came back and they were still looking at it. I couldn't hear anything because there were some technical difficulties at the place I was at. Um, I honestly was not that shocked that they overturned it, but I didn't hear the rationale for it. So I like, of course, I I don't know. I I, I could have seen it either way, but I get your point. They called it a catch on the field. I don't know why it should have been overturned. I, I feel like as fans, everyone always thinks that everyone is out to get them. But when it comes to replay in Notre Dame, it feels like way more often than not, Notre Dame is on the wrong side of it, even if there's very little evidence. And as to your question about what was the the reasoning, it was just that it touched the ground. Yeah. Um, but I just, based on what, like he had his arm on it and his other hand, so it felt like he had security. It didn't matter. If that were a bigger play, I don't, I don't know. The reaction probably would have been a lot stronger. But, yeah, I was just so annoyed by the whole sequence because they overturn it, and uh, I think even Garrett and Collinsworth were like, this should stand, and then they bring in the ref, and they're like, nope, 
this is why the ref on the field got it right or whatever. And yeah, they opted to overturn it. And I just thought it was ridiculous and unfortunate for Chris Tyree because that might have been his last home game in Notre Dame Stadium. And he uh, didn't get a catch because that one was overturned. Yeah, I guess we'll see on that. Um, speaking of annoying, uh, Broken Barrel, Chicago, calling itself a Notre Dame bar. First time I've watched a Notre Dame game there in a number of years. And it's, to put it bluntly, the worst viewing imagine, worst, worst viewing experience imaginable. Okay. The game Is it wasn't like even the on. Notre Dame bar. Is it like classify yeah. itself as the Notre Dame bar? There's in like Chicago? one of like, I don't know, there's probably like four or five of them. There might be a few more, but like they, I'll get into this. They are one of the ones that is affiliated with the Notre Dame Club of Chicago. They advertised it everywhere. Um, the game wasn't even on until about 10 minutes yeah. in. <laughs> well, the entire staff is wearing Notre Dame apparel and shirts that say something like South Bend in Chicago or something along the lines of that. You, you bring out to the staff before the game, hey, it's about to start. They just keep saying, oh, yeah, we'll get to that. It's like, no, do it right now. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> no, nothing happens. Um, on top of the fact that the service sucks, prices are way too high, and, and half the TVs don't even work that well. It's a bad viewing experience. I lasted a half there. Um, it's one that I, I, I'm going to look not to repeat ever again. And, and it had been, like I said, three or four years, and it will be another three or 400 years before I go back there for a game. So, What are your plans for the Saturday against Stanford? Are you going to purchase the Pac-12 network for the very final game? I think I actually have FUBU, to be honest. I've done this like this uh, trial thing with them a couple times. So I think I still have it right now. I think it should work on there. So is that the way with FUBU you can get the Pac-12 network? I need – don't hold me to that, but somebody said that, and I need to look into that more definitively. Um, yeah, I I was looking at the guy, like the the broadcast crew for this game, some Notre Dame alum who is clearly just like kind of a washed-up broadcaster at this point. He called Bryce Drew's shot in like 1994 and like must have just gotten passed over for jobs, and now he's on the Pac-12 network. So <laughs> go figure. Yeah, I – I don't know how I'm going to watch that game just yet. I think I'll be off work. So maybe if there's a Notre Dame bar in L.A., I'm sure there is one. I just haven't ever been able to go on a Saturday for a game watch. Um, hopefully they figure it out, and they figure it out in time for the start of the game because I don't want to get there and Notre Dame's in a in a dogfight against Stanford and uh, uh, Palo Alto. And we're yeah, just this trying feels to like on. very like early 2000s type problems. Like how do you watch the Notre Dame game where they're playing some random opponent yeah. on the West Coast? Remember when they played Air Force? Whenever they play at Air Force, it would always be on some yeah. really obscure channel. They it was like the college about. sports TV network or something like that. Exactly. I don't know if this is just like the Pac-12. I, I don't know why this is even happening. Why Why is Notre <laughs> Dame being out, being put on the Pac-12 network, and especially the last game ever? It's, it's very strange. Yeah. Um, hopefully it's not that entertaining, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Yeah. All right. You got any final thoughts on this one before we wrap it up here? No. Um, another home campaign in the books. This one, like we said on the last time I was on, was both a really long and really short season. Like that Ohio State game in some ways feels like yesterday, but also like six years ago. So, um, yeah, interesting home campaign. And uh, on to the next next game before we, we see what bowl we're in. I can tell you what, the sick feeling in my stomach because of that game has not gone away. Every time oh, I good. think about it, every time I see something that reminds me of it, it still feels very fresh. And uh, I thought that maybe by this point in the season, it would have subsided a little bit. It hasn't. But you know what? Let's end it there. Luke, we will see you again next Tuesday. All right. Sounds good. All right, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. For the everyday listeners of the show, I'll have my Stanford preview episode tomorrow morning, and that will likely be the last episode of the week before the game on Saturday because it's Thanksgiving and I'm going to be spending time with my family, and I hope you're all able to do the same on this holiday. Remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the pod and give us a follow on social media, wherever you social media. You can find us on Twitter at Lockdown Irish or on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod. My personal Twitter account is at Tyler W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Same time, same place tomorrow. See you then.